Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Matthew Moore and Emily Noble? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, and offer my analysis. Emily Noble was a resident of Westerville, Ohio. She was described as kind, neat, and organized. Gardening was an area of interest for her, and she liked to eat weeds. For example, she advocated for the consumption of dandelions, which apparently have a bitter taste. This sounds like a campaign that could have been developed by Brussels sprouts. Something like, do you think that we taste bad? Give dandelions a try and let us know what you think. Emily had more than her fair share of tragedies in her life. She had a friend who died of AIDS in the 1990s. Her first husband brought an end to his life in 2011. Her father slipped, fell, and struck his head. He was never the same. Less than 10 months later, her mother was killed in a motor vehicle collision. Emily joined an online dating site and met a man named Matthew Moore, who went by the name Matt. He had been married for a while, but divorced in 2006. He and his wife had two children. One died at a young age. After meeting Emily, Matt moved to Ohio along with his teenage son. Emily and Matt married in 2018. They lived in a condominium owned by Emily. In 2019, Matt's son started having problems with his behavior and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Matt's son brought an end to his own life not long after this. The 17-year-old was found in a park, hanging from a tree. Emily was away when this occurred. She was devastated when she found out. She took some time off work and sought mental health counseling, as Matt stayed home frequently and drank alcohol. He did not have success holding down a job. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. May 24, 2020 was Emily Noble's 52nd birthday. That evening, she and her husband, Matt, went out to celebrate. They stopped at three different restaurants before returning to their residence. According to Matt, he and his wife had sex that night and went to sleep. He awoke during the early morning hours of May 25 to use the restroom. Instead of returning to the bedroom, he went to sleep in the guest room. He did not want to disturb Emily, like he was afraid of waking her up when he returned to bed. A few hours later, at 10 a.m., Matt woke up again. Emily was not in the residence. She left her phone, keys, and wallet behind. Her vehicle was also there. Matt called a few of her friends looking for her. They told him to call the police. The police were not able to locate Emily Noble. A neighbor said that he saw Emily at 9 a.m. on May 25. Later, that neighbor would change his story and say that he wasn't sure. A search effort was conducted without success. Friends and family of Emily claimed that Matthew refused to help physically search for Emily, although he did make some efforts online to raise awareness about her disappearance. About four months later, on September 16, 2020, Emily's body was found in the woods, hanging from a tree by a USB cord. In June of 2021, Matt was arrested in connection with the death of his wife. He was charged with murder and felonious assault. In August of 2022, Matthew Moore was found not guilty of all charges. Now moving to my analysis. Was Matthew Moore guilty of murder? Despite being found not guilty by a jury, investigators still believe that Matthew was a killer. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Matthew was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Matthew was described as demanding, controlling, possessive, and unkempt, he did not work, and he drank a lot. Emily's friends didn't understand what she saw in him. They didn't think the couple was well-matched. Matt's ex-wife accused him of choking her on one occasion in 2001. Emily was treated by a mental health counselor. At no point during her treatment did she indicate a desire to hurt herself. She promised her sister she would never do anything like that. Emily did not leave a note behind. Six months of search history on her phone revealed nothing about that topic either. Friends reported that Emily was fine. After receiving counseling, 
Emily went back to work part-time and then full-time. Matt's story about getting up to use the bathroom and not returning to bed doesn't make a lot of sense. When the police arrived at Emily's condominium on the morning of May 25, her bed was made. Matt acted as if he was surprised and he had not noticed. Did Emily make her bed before leaving the residence? Damage to Emily's body appeared to be consistent with manual strangulation. For example, the pattern of fractures she sustained was unusual for hanging. A medical expert said that Emily's nose was broken as if she was beaten. Matt said that he was asleep overnight, yet his phone was active at various times through the night. Matt lied to the police about a cooler that had been moved. He blamed his wife for moving it. Two weeks before her death, Matt texted Emily, saying their marriage was over and they didn't have sex anymore. After her disappearance, Matt smoked in the house. Emily would not have approved. Matt was awake for several hours before he called anybody about Emily's disappearance. Why didn't he attempt to search the area? He knew that she sometimes would go for a walk. Two days after her disappearance, Matt referred to his wife in the past tense when speaking to investigators. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. There was disagreement among medical experts about the fractures that Emily sustained, including those related to her neck and her nose. The neck fractures may have occurred because of hanging, and some fractures may have occurred after Emily was dead. Emily was found wearing clothing that she typically put on to walk, as well as her walking shoes. There was a water bottle and an e-cigarette next to her body. There was also an e-cigarette in her pocket. These are items that a person staging the crime scene would probably not include. There were no drag marks from the condominium to the area in the woods, although Emily only weighed 100 pounds, so Matt could have carried her. Emily had just celebrated her birthday. For some people, birthdays are depressing. It's a time when people take stock of their lives. If things aren't going well, birthdays can magnify the perception of failure. The state was never able to determine when Emily died. Was it late on May 24, in the morning of May 25, or was it later? The state was never able to determine where Emily died. Did Matt kill her in the condominium? Did a stranger kill her in the woods? Or was she responsible? Emily had endured a number of hardships in her life. Many people in Emily's position would not leave a note behind. Determining exactly how Emily died is difficult considering her body would have changed position as it decomposed. In looking at a year of text messages between Matt and Emily, he did not threaten her even one time. Matt sent a message asking Emily to remain positive, which suggests she was not in a great mood. No physical evidence tied Matt to the crime scene. Matt did not have any injuries consistent with being involved in a physical struggle. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Matthew Moore was guilty? I don't think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and I'm not convinced he was guilty in reality, but that's really very hard to determine. One of the problems with this case is that if Emily was not responsible, it stands to reason that Matt was. The state made this exact argument, and Matt's defense took exception to it. But if Emily was killed by a stranger, why would her body have been staged? There are always other possibilities in a case like this, but for the most part, it comes down to either Emily did it or Matt did it. This reality put Matt in a bad position. It made him appear guilty. Despite this, there was plenty of reasonable doubt in this case. A few examples. The experts could not agree about what caused Emily's death. No physical evidence tied Matt to Emily's death, and Emily had been through a lot of trauma and could have been depressed. The state was essentially saying that if Emily did this to herself, she would have communicated her intentions to other people. But in reality, that is not true. People who are depressed are not always easy to spot. They often hide their feelings from other people. The state also promoted the theory that because Emily died on or near her birthday, or at least they think she did, her death must have been caused by murder because birthdays are a happy time. Research actually indicates the opposite. A person's risk for bringing their life to a conclusion increases on or around birthdays. The risk is anywhere from 6 to 40% higher on birthdays as compared to other days. I think the state went into this case not really understanding 
the mental health component. The last area I want to talk about in this case is how Matthew Moore's behavior made people suspicious. Matt did not assist with the physical search for Emily, he lied about moving a cooler, and he had a strange story about sleeping in a different bedroom. One of the strangest examples of his behavior was his performance on a podcast, which was covering this case. Here are a few bizarre statements that he made. When referring to Emily, he said, I never saw her get on the scale. She's very small, like 100 pounds. She was very, very, very thin, not like druggy thin. I imagine by his use of the term druggy, he is referring to a person who struggles with their intake of substances, like perhaps someone addicted to heroin. How thin does Matt believe a substance user like this would be, if not very, very, very thin? I guess people who use heroin are very, 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 very thin. Or perhaps Matt meant that his wife was thinner than someone who used drugs. He's really not clear with his statements here. Continuing with his statements, referring to his wife, he suggested that her arms and shoulders were healthy and she stood perfectly erect. He went on to say, quote, she's anatomically a really pretty lady. When she's not smiling, she'll have a look on her face that's very like there's something wrong. It's just how she is, unquote. Matt really has a way with words. What a romantic. I bet he dazzles his dates with statements like, you're really pretty, anatomically speaking, that is. After hearing his statements, it makes sense that people were suspicious of him. But it sounds like he's more awkward than insensitive, like he's just not good with language and describing people or things. Every defendant benefits from remaining silent, but some benefit more than others. Matt didn't understand that it's not a great idea for a husband to make bizarre statements about his missing wife. It sounds as though he was very, very, very unaware of how people would perceive his behavior. Those are my thoughts on the case of Matthew Moore and Emily Noble. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as Brussels sprouts who launch a campaign to increase their own consumption. Thanks for watching.